early in 11th grade and go to Bonn International School. My topic for tonight is globalization. The reason why I chose this topic is because we've been exploring this topic in geography class and it interests me. More specifically, I will be examining the patterns and the effects which globalization has had on us in the 21st century. Let us begin by examining a definition of globalization. Globalization can be defined as the development of an increasingly integrated global economy, marked especially by free trade, free flow of capital, and the tapping of foreign cheaper labor markets. This definition was amongst one of the first which I came across, and I found it very interesting because this shows a phrase which I did not expect. It is the tapping of foreign cheaper labor markets because this insinuates that globalization, a term which we frequently encounter on an everyday basis, has deeper ties to something I would consider exploitation. Next, let us examine where your shoes were made from in order to explore this topic. Please take a look at your shoes. You can do this right now, or you can do this when you get home. In all likelihood, your shoes were made from one of these three countries. They might have been made in China, Vietnam, or in India. Here you can see a picture of my friend's shoes. They were made in China. You may ask yourself, what does this have to do with globalization? Well, 87% of all footwear produced in 2020 was produced in China. And this tells us about globalization, that in our modern society, we have developed a dependency on China's willingness and ability to sustain footwear production. And so, if countries such as India and Vietnam were to be accounted for in this figure, 87% would be a lot higher. The question that is to be begged is, how come these countries play such a significant role in the goods which we consume every single day? And how does the misallocation of resources, how is the misallocation of resources represented here? We can take a look at China's and India's respective GDP. The peak of China's GDP was in 2007 at 14.2, whilst India's was at 8.5 in 2010. The respective GDP growths differ by 5.4%, which is pretty significant. And the reason why they differ, we will examine in this presentation. How did China accomplish such large economic growth? That's the question that it begs. We use the dependency theory in order to examine this question. The dependency theory relies on four basic premises. The first premise is that there are three categorizations of countries. There are core countries, there are semi-periphery countries, and then there are periphery countries. And these categorizations rely on physical and human factors. Core countries are the recipients of net migration, meaning that people from the periphery countries come towards the core countries, and they are the subject of invest investments, meaning that companies often invest in core countries rather than periphery. This leads us to find out that periphery countries often lack investment and are exported. But in order to, in order to show you guys what this means, I've included examples. This shouldn't just be a theory lesson. Here's an example but used using the map of Europe. We can see some countries which hopefully you can identify. And something that these, co these countries share is that they're all core countries. One distinct physical feature is the coastline which they share. What's another can be the flatlands which helps them become a core country. The Netherlands is the flattest country in Europe. A human feature which they, which, which they share is the development of transportation and the stable democracy. These all help in one issue. The issue that there are these categorizations of countries which, which determine the way that wealth is distributed in and internationally. The reason why I did not mention China is because China holds a unique position. It is on its way to becoming a poor country from a semi-periphery country. And in international affairs, this means that China has played an increasing role in the importance. We can also see that global investors have looked towards China for new investing in electric car markets or in the medicine production market. Here we have a picture of the continent of Africa and the significant role which Chinese TNCs, transnational, transnational corporations, 
have played in Africa. In 2018 alone, 100.8 billion US dollars were invested in the continent, of which 4 billion US dollars went to Ethiopia. Chinese TNCs don't have direct profits at heart. Instead, they play a game in the long run. They invest in countries which are unable to pay back these profits in hopes of negotiating terms with the government officials. For example, taking advantage of the relaxed environmental policies and labor policies which these countries might feature, or being able to have access to the natural resources. An example is the People's Democratic Republic. People's, sorry, an example is the Democratic Republic of Congo. The Democratic Republic of Congo is classified as a periphery country and is the largest cobalt deposit on Earth. It holds about 60% of Earth's cobalt, of which 70% Chinese firms own due to their investment in the continent over the past 20 years. Cobalt is an increasingly valuable resource because cobalt can be used in the electric car market, uh, in the manufacturing of electric cars, which is an emerging market. And so the monopoly which Chinese firms have over this resource is very, very valuable. But we saw this type of transaction before. We saw this in America's involvement in the Middle East when crude oil became increasingly important for them. In order to ensure stable and low crude oil prices, America got involved. And we can see this form of neocolonialism once more in the Congo. Over here we have another visualization of this. At the very top we have the United States of America. And in second place we have China. And China is taking over its position as a core country, being able to exploit all the countries down below. India is one of them, the Democratic Republic of Congo is another, and at the top are other core countries, which you cannot see in this figure. The last question, which has to be the answer, is what has changed over the years? Not only has the sheer volume of goods that are transported internationally changed, we can see the development of technology has allowed this to happen. This is the, the boats. These are boats used by the East India Company. Over here we have a 1960 cargo ship, and down here we have the Mumbai Mosaic, which is used in the 21st century. And we can see this has led to the increasing transit this has led to the increasing transportation of goods internationally, making neocolonialism a subject of more subtle colonialism. There is no longer a need for companies to hire seaboys like the East India Company did. There are more subtle forms of neocolonialism, and that is why you seldom hear about this in the news. This is the definition of colonialism can be defined as the act of taking control over an area or country that is not your own, especially using force and sending people from your own country to live there. Chinese firms, Chinese firms, transnational corporations, are getting involved in countries in, in Africa. And Africa is not their own country. And their profits are being, their, their profits are counting towards the Chinese GDP. And so we can see that the profits which they make have an influence on the growth of GDP. The only question, the only thing left to examine is the positive evaluation of globalization. Because tonight we've talked about the negative things, the stuff involved with the periphery. But there are positive things. For example, the sanctions which we have imposed on Russia, which have allowed us to have a, a non-violent form of intervention to, to show support for the Ukraine. I hope that in the future we can use globalization as a weapon to combat injustice because we can see if an if a ethical party supervises globalization, it can be used as an effective tool. And so for climate change, for plastic pollution and inflation, we need ethical parties supervising this tool. Thank you very much for listening.